Yeah, as you're looking already um, around the world, just using you know the observations we have from 1960 to the recent period, we're already losing yields as a result of climate change um, and growing temperatures in most regions of the world. The United States is one where it's a little harder to detect that, but um, in the tropics and subtropics, you're definitely already detecting that. And as we move to the future, um, I think there's widespread consensus that growing season temperatures are going to be higher than in the next uh, 30 to 50 years than they have been over the past 100 years in many tropic and subtropic areas. So the question is, you know, will the United States, Canada be able to pick up the slack? And I think we're really already pushing up against um, high temperatures in a lot of these uh, very productive areas. Um, and so I don't think we have that much leeway without a lot of technological change in the types of cultivars and the types of seeds that we're actually using in the field. And I think um, really focusing on adaptation and, and trying to breed for heat tolerance seed varieties and drought tolerance is going to be incredibly important if we're going to have a, a rosy picture of what's ahead. It's really hard to breed for heat tolerance actually, or drought tolerance through conventional breeding because it involves multiple genes. And so it's a quantitative trait and uh, not easy to do like it would be to allocate more of the um, energy to the grain production in a plant, for example. And so most of the techniques that are being used, particularly by the private sector, are um, genetic modifications to get heat tolerance or drought tolerance. And I think that probably will be the strategy that they'll use in the future. For drought tolerance, you can do some uh, drought stress breeding in a more conventional way, which they've been doing in Africa, and that has been successful. Of course, um, you are going to trade off with other, other qualities that you want in a plant, whether it be how much goes into the grain or um, other kinds of resistance that you might get. You know, usually when you're putting energy into one trait, you're taking it out of another trait. And so those are going to be the, the sort of challenges as we go forward with a breeding strategy. I, yeah, we, we can. I think we need to go out of the bounds of what we're thinking about with food production in the future when we think about climate change. And if we're only going to think about the major crops, uh, corn, rice, you know, wheat, which doesn't grow well in the tropics, but it might grow in the subtropics, if those are the only crops we're thinking about, I think we will have some problems. But there are a lot of crops that are more indigenous, actually, to very hot areas anyway. Um, that could come into the mix a little bit more um, for a number of different uses. For example, sorghum as a livestock feed instead of uh, corn as a livestock feed. That would, that would definitely be an obvious one. Um, but there's other, other crops as well. And I think um, thinking about a crop diversity the, and the kinds of crops that have and will withstand higher heat and less moisture is part of the strategy we need to embrace. One of the things that doesn't get talked about much is, is irrigation in particularly places in Africa where only 4% is currently irrigated. And, and so when you think of much higher temperatures in the future, it's not just going to be heat stress, but it's going to be a reduction of soil moisture for the crops themselves. And yet there is virtually no irrigation at all. A recent study by David LaBelle and his colleagues showed that when you could measure heat stress, you got a certain decrease in yields, but when that was also matched by soil moisture stress, the drop in yields was significantly higher. And so focusing on water and how to get water in um, small scale, more distributed systems in Africa, I think is something that no one's talking about, that they should be talking about for both climate adaptation and for incomes. And particularly if we start thinking about all the demands for food that we have out there. It's not just food and feed, but also biofuels now and the increase in prices. Trying to figure out a way for small-scale subsistence farmers to benefit from these gains and to diversify their crops so they can also uh, maybe hedge against price increases if they're net consumers and grow more staple, um, staple crops at home or more diversified nutritious crops for home consumption 
is really, really important. So thinking about irrigation and small-scale distributed systems for irrigation, as well as you know, breeding for these different qualities, which usually never actually reaches the smallest, poorest farmers, uh, is going to be very important.